Hi Rod, um, welcome to Coaching Kōrero with um, Sharon Cooney on a beautiful sunny day it looks like in your part of the world, not quite saying in my part of the world. Um, thank you very much for joining us again. Um, I would like to introduce Rod Corbin who is the sports psychologist for the Silver Ferns and this today we're going to chat a little bit about um, the psychology of coaching, working within um, the coaching environment and how Rod as a sports psychologist helped hopefully um, the Silver Ferns gained their gold medal. It was an amazing moment. So um, one of the questions I'd like to ask you, Rod, is um, in that moment, when did you think that the Silver Ferns believed that they could do it? Um, I think probably at the first Aussie game, uh, when we lost to them by one goal, uh, ironically, uh, came away from that game going, uh, one of the, you know, there were some key things that they were working on as a, they were working on as a team. And even though we lost by one goal, there were some things that had, that had occurred during that game that gave them real confidence that they could they could do the stuff they talked about wanting to do. Um, yeah, so it was that game I think was a real turning point. Ironically, the game against Ireland actually was it wasn't it wasn't a point where I think they got belief, but it was actually one of Knowles' strengths. So we we play Ireland if you followed it, and, and we win, but we didn't play that well. Uh, <laughs> And and Noel in the change room afterwards actually reminded the team of of the values of the team and what we were here. What we were here. It wasn't so much about winning; it was about how we win and how we play. So um, that was also, I think, a key turning point. So when we when we look at working um, in a in a, a sporting and team environment, and you talk about um, they often talk about culture and developing a culture within a team. What do you? What was your view on the? I suppose that the Silver Fern culture um, at, at that World Cup campaign. Um, at that campaign, well, the, the, I think you start culture for me is always shifting and changing depending on your personnel. So Nolan obviously takes the reins, and any of you that know Nolan has a particular way of working, very authentic. When we talk about authentic leadership, she probably is. You know, if you want to look at the definition of authentic leadership, you'd look in the dictionary. It just probably says Nolan Tarua. <laughs> uh, uh, and so you have a you have a coach who has a strong vision of of what it's about, but also it's about winning, but also about care, caring for each other. And so that was one of the key themes that ran through the whole campaign was caring for each other, uh, and and being really consistent in that. So everything we did, and I made reference to the game against Ireland, where you know even though we'd won, hadn't done it in a way that that we talked about doing it and what we were about as a team. And so being really, so you say, here's our culture and here's how we do things and being consistent with that. I think often you know, you'll see, you'll see organisations or teams have vision statements or mission statements or what purpose statements and they're lovely words, but they're, they're, their behaviour doesn't follow it. So I think the key with any culture is, you know, you, you do what you say you're going to do. Um, another part of the, the, the I think Nolan was really strong and being really honest and open. Again, you'll hear these conversations, let's be open and honest with each other, but you, then you have a, a leader who is really open and honest and it's quite challenging. So, for example, my role, um, I, I've worked, netball's always had mental skills trainers or psychologists, uh, and I've, I've been in and out of netball for probably 15 years, and, and I've always found it quite frustrating. I'd come into a netball team and the, the, the players are always very lovely and engaging and welcoming and they'd come along and, and they'd do their mental skills stuff um, and then go away. And so they basically check a box. Whereas Nolene, you know, I think one of the early on, she said, look, every review we've ever had with the silver friends and we lose is we're not mentally strong enough. So I've got Rod here to do that. Um, so we can either do what we've always done and just pay it lip service or can actually do it properly. Because if we do, if we do the first thing, we're going to get the same outcome. So she, she was really, again, really strong on... If we do what we've done before, we're going to get the same outcome. So let's do things differently. Uh, I think another aspect of the culture was, again, around this open and honest conversation. So that was the example I gave of Nolan being really open and honest with the players. We set stuff up um, where we tried to do that every day. So, for example, I might run a little workshop exercise and I would say to the, the players, if I'm going to call, excuse me, I'm going to call bullshit. You know, if I think you're being fluffy or just being really superficial in the answers, you know. uh, so you might call it a little vulnerability session where we're trying to be trying to show each other a bit of our vulnerability. And I would always start. So I'd start. Here's, here's me. 
and all the staff would staff would be. So it's not just the players, because often I think again, you know, we'll, we'll expect players to do stuff, but not the staff. So that was another part of the a strong part of the culture is that everyone did everything was required. I didn't do the training, of course, because I'm lazy. Uh, the physical <laughs> training. Um, but every everything that that we asked the players to do, the staff were pretty much asked to do, and and yeah, and it was a it was a just a key theme that ran through the whole campaign. Ironically, it wasn't about winning. We talked about, and it's not actually about winning. It's about winning, but it's not about winning. Uh, sports about winning, but actually, it was about trying to rebuild the manner of the Silver Ferns after what they'd been through, but also you know uh, about trying to model to young. You know, not necessarily uh, Pacific and Māori, but you know, Pacific and Māori young females, good role models of being fit, healthy, and and having fun. So it was another part. Of, you know, we've got to got to have fun. And again, if you anyone knows Nolene, she likes to have fun, and so that was part of the culture. We, we've got to have a laugh. So if you watch some of the footage of uh, before the games, girls would come out and, and and you know people that know netball in England, netball fans are crazy, and the noise is crazy. Coming out and waving, waving and smiling and laughing and and, and having a good time. So, they were they were the key aspects of the culture. And it was just like I said, I think the key thing for me is we didn't just talk about it, actually modelled it and modelled from the leadership. The other key part I think of the culture is you've got Nolene and her relationship with Maria, Casey, and Laura. I think that was really important as well. Mm. Yeah, her relationship with the fossils. If we mm. if we take that to um, another level, so a lot of our coaches that um, will listen to this will be working um, at a secondary school level or a premier competition level. Mm. They have less time with their um, coaches. And one of the coach, some of the coaches um, are commenting around the secondary school space, where some of these kids appear to have a lot on their plate and mm. are actually struggling to maintain that balance where there may well be a strong sporting culture within their school, but they're NCA, they're year 13, they're ready to head off to university. So have you got any sort of like strategies for coaches to help them help their kids deal with the level of busyness in people's lives at the moment? Well, not right now, but clearly we're yeah. back. Well, actually, no, uh, Shaz, it's interesting. Yesterday I was on a call with a few athletes and they are busy. They've actually got university work uh, and training, so they're just as busy. But uh, this is my own opinion. I, I just I, I don't like the sport academy system that a lot of the schools have because for exactly those reasons, it, you actually set up these high-performance environments for teenagers and you expect them to be high-performance high athletes when actually they're not. They're teenagers and they need to be out engaging with their friends, uh, having fun, uh, and, you know, and 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 looking forward to the rest of their life, I think you know, uh, often sports will say to me, "Why do we get such a dropout at you know, 17, 18? And, and I go, "Because you've made the kids hate it. That's why. You know, you've made it such a chore." So my my tip tips are always to parents is to listen to your children, um, give them space to to do what they want. With coaches, I guess, and, and it's hard for coaches because they're they're probably wrapped up in a performance outcome. You know, their KPIs around winning and winning is important. And so again, almost you know, coaches being really clear on what's important to them. You know, and if they feel like a, if a young girl is struggling with the, with the load, is is maybe ease that load if they can somehow. Um, you know, it's all right. It's all right if you you know don't 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 come to that training. It's okay. Um, yeah, I, I just I I just think this the way we set it up. Is not helpful, and then there's the social media thing around you know, kids, the model that social media presents to children or to, to young people around what they should be like. So even for some of our elite athletes, you'll see some athletes are posting social media stuff and all the training they're doing and they're training really well. And a lot of the other athletes are going, "Oh, it's just really depressing me. It's demotivating because I'm not doing that," and they feel bad about themselves. So you know, I guess my advice to coaches is, is to listen. Um, Try not to get too wrapped up in the winning of it, and and look after your young players because they are the future of the game. You know, you want your players to keep playing. Exactly, you want our our, our really good young secondary school kids to leave school loving the game. So therefore, mm. wanting. And if we look at the our silver ferns, you look at the average age of that world champs team, they were 30. So if by the time they are finishing secondary school and they're feeling burnt out, well, you know, potentially if they're going to be that good, there's 12 more years of uh, being mm. involved in the sport to reach your pinnacle. Mm. Um, I think often, Shaz, as well, we ask these young 
people, young girls, to do stuff that adults find hard, like reflection, set goals, do lots of written stuff. And I go, just didn't play netball. Seriously, just let them play netball. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because, mm. um, as you say, self-reflection is a really challenging um, activity to do, even if you are trained in it and you go to university mm. to figure it all out. It's still really challenging. Mm. But disappointment and dealing with disappointment is um, is common in sport. There will be some games that are we should have won and we didn't win, or there is an athlete who um, has a, a season-ending injury. So dealing with coaches ask those sorts of questions. You know, how do I deal with um, disappointment? A of the game that I just lost that I should have won at a at an event, and or mm. B, the young athlete that I'm going to have to say, look, you're not going to be part of the season. But there is another season to come. Yeah, um, no magic answer for that one. Um, people are going to be disappointed. It's funny, really interesting. I uh, worked in one sport I was in. We are away overseas at a World Cup. And we'd lost a game that we should have won. And it had actually had quite big uh, ramifications for the funding and that going forward. And we get back to the hotel and one of the players says to me, oh, Rod, you'll be really busy tonight, won't you? I went, why? Oh, you know, talking to people, I'm going, why would I talk to people? Because we're upset. I says, yeah, you're upset, and you will be upset. I said, but you'll be okay. You'll wake up tomorrow, and, and you'll still feel a little bit upset, as you should, because it's really important to you. But in two or three days' time, you're fine. If in two or three days' time you're not, then maybe I'll talk to you. So I'm a big believer, and people will be upset or disappointed, and we actually have to let them work through that process. I remember, again, Rao was talking as it was rowing this time. The rowing high performance director said, oh, we need, to, we need you to be at the World Champs. And I went, um, why? Why would I be there? Oh, in case they lose. I go, what am I going to do if they lose? Well, you can make them feel better. I go, no, I won't. Well, in fact, I'll go nowhere near them because they'll probably punch me um, because they're upset. And they should be because you know, it's really important to them. So one is to give, give yourself permission to, to be disappointed and feel upset. Um, the injury, injury one's a hard one. I think we often neglect the psychological aspect of injury, particularly long-term injury. Uh, interesting. So we've got a couple of girls that like had you know, quite severe career, not, uh, season ending injuries. And then coaches with well intentioned are going, oh, yeah, come along. We want you involved. We want you involved in all the stuff. Come to training. Come to the meetings. And sometimes it's the worst thing for them because they just sit there going, oh, I'm useless. I can't do anything. I can't contribute. So again, I always say to coaches, you know, invite your athletes to come to the training if they're injured. But let them do it on their terms. You know, I often say to the athletes, you want to go to training? Go to training. If you don't, if not, then don't. Uh, and, and I had one athlete, a female athlete, not a nipple, but a different sport, who was injured and she would go to training and she said to me, Rod, they all ask me how I'm feeling. It actually just makes me feel worse. So I said, so we sat down, we constructed a, a, like a, an email she sent to the whole team going, hey, um, really cool that you're asking me how I'm feeling when I come to training because I really care about me, but uh, please don't ask me because it just upsets me. I'm all good and if I'm not all good, I'll let you know. So again, being really clear on how you're feeling, I think is really important. I might have said in a previous interview or even today around the importance of values. And we talked about the school-based stuff before. If your whole identity is wrapped up in the sport, that's when you struggle the most. So I do a lot of work with athletes on identity and their values and what and who they care about outside of their sport. Um, some, of the, some of the people watching this video might have seen the Pure a documentary that uh, they made around the World Cup. And, a part of his ruthless mindset as the R and pure and part of ruthless mindset is identity and values you know what and who do you care about outside of netball because you do so much more outside of netball so again allowing people to to engage in other aspects of their life that aren't about netball so when they are injured yes they're disappointed but hey I'm also a student I'm, I'm a partner I can engage in this stuff it's given me time to do this uh, if, I, if I well I go back to the civil things we talked about the reason why that identity and values is in the ruthless mindset is because in the heat of the battle, under pressure, you have got something that, you know, you're not just defined by this one moment. If you cock it up or it doesn't go well, yes, you'll be disappointed, but you're more more—you're more than this. You're more than the network. That's, a, that's something we'll often talk about in the things. We're more, more than this game. We're more than this performance. Um, so again, for me, particularly at a younger age, and we know this around identity and self-concept in adolescence, is trying to build a, a more holistic feeling, a sense of self-concept. You know, who am I as a person? If I'm just a netballer, then I'm only loved because I'm a netballer. 
then the consequence of things going wrong in that that domain is massive compared to yes i'm a netball it's a big part of my life but i'm also a student i want to be a nurse a doctor or a dentist or a builder or whatever i'm also a, a daughter or a son and i have a connection with my culture or my family and so you're trying to develop that stuff as well yeah, that's really, really important, I think, especially at that secondary school space when, when we talk about the fact that they are so busy and they're trying to um, find themselves, but sometimes um, one element can um, potentially take over. And, and as mm. you alluded to a little bit in the school setting with the some of the academy programs and the high performance programs, it tends to um, sometimes monopolise where they're at and then they become that netball or that rugby player and, and some of the other stuff. Um, drops by the wayside and, mm -hmm. and look at you know really interesting times at the moment with rugby where you know with the netball I know we really actively encourage all the way through any um, high performance program you are you are a netballer but what are you as well because mm. netball is a finite part of your world where you look at rugby where it can be it could be New Zealand it could be Italy it could be France they could build their whole world about being a rugby player and we look at this time now where potentially that may well mm. dissolve and disintegrate to a point and then what else have they got in their lives to support them financially as well as um, psychologically and socially yeah I know rugby historically have uh, had a bit of look through the rugby over the years and they used to run an under 17s program which that which was never picked a New Zealand team but part of the under 17s program at the camps there would be things to the parents around the stuff we're talking about self-concept the importance because you know you can imagine you're a young Pacific Island boy in a family and the family goes, oh, here's a route for our, our son or our daughter to make some real money, um, whether there's, there, which is great, but there's also real danger in that as well. So it's trying to explain to the parents the importance of development outside of their sport. And I think netball does it relatively well. I mean, they, they utilise the High Performance Sport New Zealand Athlete Life Programme pretty well, um, not just in the in the franchises, but uh, the top game teams, but also in the Bico League as well. And so that's a real, real tip for netball is that they do see the importance of that that athlete identity outside of their sport as being important. And also at a secondary school level, um, coaches understanding that that the academic side of that young secondary school kids' world is 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 really important, and ensuring mm. that they support that enough and not bog them down with too many trainings and too many games. Well, you look at Laura. Laura is a qualified accountant. You know, she's a pretty good netballer as well, eh? Yeah, you know. and she's a Pilates instructor. And she's done lots of different yeah. things. For us. She that, has. That, is, that, is, that is Laura, though, and that she can do lots yeah. of things. She's super good. Exactly. And Millie Lee's um, trained as a um, as a doctor, as yes, she trained right. as a silver fern as well. So came yeah. out with a great, great thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things, one well, last question before we leave is dealing with conflict. Um, so some of the coaches, as humans, we you know we don't all see eye to eye because we're different. We're different individuals. And um, one of the coaches was asking questions about you know how do you deal with conflict within a team setting to um, to pave the way to a, a good outcome or a or a happy team. Yeah, so I always go. You actually have to allow conflict to exist. Uh, and I think as humans, we're taught, and particularly, as I'm going to be very stereotypical, is particularly as females don't like conflict and will do everything to avoid conflict if they can. But what happens if you avoid the face-to-face -face conflict? Then what you get is a, a lot of sort of rumination or uh, people whispering behind people's backs, and then it just gets worse. So I have this thing around within teams. You actually have to. Well, that's of me and you disagree, then we actually have to be allowed to disagree. Mm. Um, and be okay with that. So often with coaches, I'll say to a coach when I first we start working with them, it's probably why I don't get too many jobs, is I go, I'm never going to be your yes person. So my job here is to ask you questions. If I think we're doing something that, that I don't think is helpful, then I'm going to tell you that. And then we can work through it. And at the end of the day, you might go, Rod, um, I don't care, this is what I'm doing. And I'll go, okay, sweet, I'm on board, as long as it's not going to harm anyone. And then when it falls over, I can say, I told you so. But um, <laughs> it happens all the time. So I think, you, yeah, you have to allow conflict. Now, how you set that up is, is again, we talk about civil friends culture. We had this thing where we could disagree. We were allowed to disagree and be okay with it. Um, and we and we managed it. Uh, so it was part of the culture. But it's done in the service of what's best for the team. And it's not about me trying to beat you or so that I'm better than you. It's about I'm disagreeing with you because I don't think that's best for the team. But can we work through it? And actually, the end of that conflict might be weak. You're going to have to just agree to disagree. This is where the coach often then steps in. So the coach has to be the parent in a way and go, okay, this is what we're doing. 
And so sometimes the coach will, will have to make a decision and it will be unpopular with lots of some people. Um, I have this thing around trust and one of them is, is around, it's a triangle obviously, and it's got three points to the triangle and one is around logic. So being, if you make a decision, making sure that the logic that you use to make the decision is really clear and obvious, it makes sense. Um, so that's also one way to resolve a bit of conflict is being really clear on why you're doing this thing. Uh, so be okay with conflict. Uh, it's better to have it out in the open than behind closed doors where then you tend to get cliques and people talking about each other behind each other's back. That's the other thing I coach say, oh, I don't want cliques, Robert. I don't want cliques. And I go, well, humans, some humans all, all like others better than others. And so something you're going to get and be okay with that. There's often something I'll also say around conflict where if you come to me and say, oh, Rod, you know, I'm really annoyed at... Um, X, you know, X is really pissing me off, and I go, okay, sweet, and I'll, and I'll let you talk about X for a while, and you go away, and then you might come back tomorrow and go, oh, right, X is still really annoying me, I'm still doing this, and I might be okay with that, but if you come back to me a third time, I'll go, Shaz, you're talking to the wrong person, you need to be talking to X, not me, right, so again, having some ways to manage that conflict is important. Yeah, because I think as females, as you say, we don't particularly like the conflict but then also then having to address it rather than letting it um yeah. foster and yeah i think because of the conflict thing is if, if, if you are i think well, not just females i think males as well our males handle hand, you know, males get over stuff males don't get over stuff they'll, they'll hide for 20 years and have a big punch up uh, <laughs> but, but yeah I'll, I'll go um it's it's just better just to get to 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 talk about it because we but the thing is, we take it personally. So if you're giving me some negative feedback, or then it's something like, oh, you don't like me as a person. Now, you might not like me, but that's not the point. You know, is that I have to, if, if, if we have this bigger picture of what the team's about, then we actually have to be able to have those discussions. One thing that, um, and truth and reality is, and whether this is, is, is truth and reality, but mental health issues associated with the human race per se, and maybe our young, is becoming more apparent and often as a coach um, our coaches connect with our young often quite often during um, say for at a secondary school environment they may see them three or four times a week mm. so if a coach is sensing that there are some issues with with a player that she is um, as she is coaching what's her best strategy yeah, I think the thing for psychologists, what we I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure where the incidence of things like anxiety and depression are going up. You know, we think about twenty percent of people during their lifetime will experience some sort of form of mental health issue. But I think what we're seeing is young; it's getting younger. So mm. uh, um, we start to see 13, 14 year olds, twelve year olds uh, exhibiting signs of uh, quite severe mental health issues, which which is new, I think. And I think you're right. What, what often happens is, as a coach, will um, will be someone who, because of the age, will they'll look at look to as a parent of some sort. And it might be actually quite a, a nurturing space for them, a safe space to talk about things. So they they often will. Um, I think the things to look out for for me is that all adolescents will struggle from time to time. You know, all humans struggle from time to time. The thing for me is if, if it's pervasive, if you see it a lot, if you see people that are continually emotionally upset, maybe distracted, just not enjoying themselves or, or life, disconnecting themselves from others that they would normally um, be connected with, they're, they're, they're warning signs for me. Uh, I often say it's really hard with adolescents because they're, they're not, they don't want to talk, they don't want to be seen as, as being different, so they want to be able to fit in. But trying to leverage off the relationship you have with that individual. Are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, if at any time you need anything from me, just let me know. I th think if you are concerned, you know, get them to go to their GP. First off, look, maybe go and see, just try and have a chat to your doctor about it. Um, there's also, I, I think that's sometimes difficult because oh, you know, I don't want, don't want I don't, because a lot of it is expectation. I don't want to let mum and dad down, my, my mum and dad will, I think there's something wrong with me and but it's around I always just reiterate that generally parents love their children and, and want the best for them generally it's not always I say that's not always the case um, is that your yeah, mum and dad just want you to be happy you know, like mum and dad just want to make sure you're okay so just trying trying to to get them to to get help if you are concerned most schools have guidance counsellors who are trained counsellors 
um, that's another op option for them as well. Yeah, but it's, I would say it's not the coach's responsibility to fix them. You know, they can no. they, they can help them get advice or seek help. Yeah, and I think sometimes that's where um, that 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 statement in itself is really important. Is yeah. is it's not the job for the coach to fix them, but they may be the one that identifies there as an issue and what are the mm. processes that they feel comfortable with to to send this kid in a pathway that's going to be helpful short term and long term. Yeah. And if it, and if the, if the young player really you know feels safe with them, they'll probably listen to them. Uh, mm. You should see the school council. Oh, I don't know the school council; they're a bit of a dick. Okay, well maybe go and talk to your GP. You know. Mm. Yeah, just some 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 nice strategies. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Hey, thank you for your time, Rod. Um, enjoy your day in the mighty Waikato. Great place to live. I lived there for a few years myself. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, enjoy your your lockdown for how long it ever is going to be. Enjoy your baking, mm. and um, really keen for you to share some of your recipes. I'd like to know what you're doing. <laughs> sure, I will do. Okay, okay cheers. Good to talk. Hey, cheers. Great. Catch up sometime. See you. Bye-bye.